So last year I was visiting home. Me and my mom have always had a fetish for a Christmas carol. And we have watched, since I was born, nearly every version that exists. Based on the trailers, we were super pumped for the FX production to release their new version of Christmas Carol, which was supposed to be rated mature and promised to be very dark and gritty. Now, I love A Christmas Carol because it is the darkest Christmas story there is, at least as far as keeping the spirit of the holiday goes. Damned spirits whose personal hell is that they must watch their loved ones and the needy and the poor suffer knowing that it is their fault for not doing more in their lifetime and knowing they can never do anything else to help them. That's brilliant. Seeing a man throw his entire life away because of a deep-seated psychological fear of poverty, which ironically causes him to keep others in abject poverty by pure circumstance. The poor being shown freezing to death on Christmas Eve, begging for basic human necessities that we all desperately need. And of course, the infamous surplus population line, where the main character literally says there are too many people in the world and they just need to die for the rest of us to get on and for society to improve. And I've went on about that line in several other videos that we've done so far. What is grand about The Christmas Carol, what makes it work, is that A Christmas Carol is not actually about Christmas. And some people miss this. I've heard some big name reviewers on YouTube who have said, I never really liked The Christmas Carol because basically all it says is, if you're not celebrating Christmas, then you're a jerk. And just because I celebrate Christmas doesn't mean everybody else has to celebrate Christmas. And they have literally missed the point of the entire story. They, I don't know how they've done it, but they've somehow missed the entire point. The point of this story, what's brilliant about it, is it can go to these dark places because in the end it's not about Christmas. It's about personal responsibility. Now I know that is hard because a lot of people, especially a, especially a huge chunk of the population now that are pretty much living their lives online, do not like personal responsibility, but that is what A Christmas Carol is about and that's what makes it brilliant. That's some dark stuff already by itself, and I feel like you could go much deeper and darker with it. Some other versions, at least in moments, certainly have, and they've become some of my favorite moments. Even the Rankin-Bass children's production has some really horrifying moments. So, this got me and my mom really excited, and we sat down and watched it beginning to end in one night. And I was a little bit disappointed. So I want to talk exactly about why I'm so disappointed with it, because I actually loved almost all of it. First, let me compliment these writers and filmmakers, and especially the actors, because they were very brave, and all of them did a grand job. I truly mean that. Bravo. I applaud you, all of you, because this production was stellar from start to finish. The problem really solely is in the story, and mainly starts at about the 1 hour and 45 minute mark. But first, in the spirit of the season and in the spirit of fairness, I want to talk about all of the great things in those first two hours. This is probably the longest version of the story I've ever seen, weighing in at a whopping two hours and 52 minutes. So let's not waste any more time, let's get right into it. The film starts in 1843 on Christmas Eve. A young man pisses on Jacob Marley's tombstone, literally, establishing visually that Marley is dead as a doornail. Very, very nicely done. We go down to see the body in the casket, and then he wakes up. Now, I thought this was getting very dark right off, showing Marley getting his chains on the same Christmas Eve he died. It would be a very, very twisted way to make sure that we have a moment of intense horror and panic when he thinks he's been buried alive. But instead, it's actually played for comedy, and he just yells as the pee drips down into his face. Can't you read the inscription? It says, rest in peace. Why am I not allowed any peace? So in this darker adaptation, Marley strangely suffers less than he did in the original. His suffering should be an immense burden. The chain is his eternal penance. And the true punishment is that he has to struggle to help those who, of course, he can no longer help. Now, in some versions, and I, I can appreciate this too, some productions make it his purgatory, a temporary punishment, that he actually repented on his deathbed, but even though he repented on his deathbed and now he's going to go to heaven, he still has to work off, sort of like working off the pounds that he's gained on earth, and let go of all of the 
the nasty thoughts and feelings that he's had on Earth. Either way really works great. Both versions of that work fantastic. That is very dark. But this is played more like it's an inconvenience. In this version, he just lies sleeplessly in his coffin for seven years. It's dark, but it's played more like an inconvenience than anything else. If you were gonna go this route, then he should look gaunt and, and like he's starved. He should have dark lines under his eyes. He should look almost like a skeleton, like he has withered throughout these seven years, eternally, uh, eternally starving, eternally dying of exhaustion, but unable to rest, unable to fix it as he's trapped in his coffin. Now, that would have been really fascinating. Have him stuck in his own decomposing body. That would be really dark. But instead, he just stays perfectly preserved, and he's even kind of a little portly, which, you know, no judgment, no body shaming. I, I am too. But it really does not come across like he's suffering all that much. It's just, like I said, played as an inconvenience. Then chapter one starts, The Human Beast. And here's where the great stuff really begins. We see the Cratchits leaving church, and we hear that Bob has work on Christmas Day. Next, we see Scrooge played to mwah, perfection by Guy Pierce. I mean, really great casting. Guy Pierce is such a, a great actor. He's one of my favorites. And he's a much closer age to the age that Scrooge was implied to be in the book, which I would imagine is somewhere in his late, late 50s, somewhere in his early to mid 60s. Although some versions like to play him as if he's 80 and he's got to be young enough to see uh, Tim, Tim Cratchit grow up. And so that is important. He has to have some years left to his life. So I actually do like his age and I think Guy Pierce just does a fantastic job in this role. It's, he plays it like he was born to play it. Scrooge tells Bob to make three copies of a letter that he will not allow Bob to leave early from work today unless he gets them done. Now, a really, really nice touch is that the office is actually so cold that the ink is literally frozen. That's a great little detail that just adds so much to it. It makes you feel how cold this office is. I also enjoy how Bob and Scrooge have a very different dynamic. Scrooge actually complains about Christmas to Bob. He gives a very good explanation as to why he hates the holiday. He asks how many Christmases are truly meant which is a wonderful, wonderful setup for the end because when he is redeemed and he says Merry Christmas to everybody, you know that he has given some thought to it. He means those Merry Christmases. It really is a merry day to him. He asks why we all act nice to each other one day of the year and disgusting to each other the other 364. Wouldn't it be better to do it the other way around? So if you're still looking for who's responsible for the purge, it was this guy. Send him your hate mail. It's a surprisingly good reason, and even he says he doesn't believe humans can be transformed, which is even better set up for his redemption. But unfortunately, again, the redemption is rather downplayed, and it actually took me two or three times watching it before I fully appreciated his redemption at all, because it is so downplayed. Scrooge shows that he monitors rather ocd -ly the exact predictability of those around him. He counts everything. The number of bumps on the carriage wheels, the number of people singing outside his door. He counts all of them, illustrating brilliantly how he literally weighs the entire world around him by gain and numbers. He talks to Marley, even though he is dead, and I think that's a, just genius. It shows that this atheistic character in this particular version is not entirely disbelieving. There is a, a little bit of a crack in him that can be wiggled into. It also sets up for the original line in the book, where Marley says he spent many years standing by Scrooge's side, invisible, but trying to tell him to change his ways. That would be really, really brilliant setup for that moment. Especially if you added in an extra line where Marley maybe said, I spent many years by your side trying to will you to change your ways, and I heard you talking to me. And, you know, my old friend, it, it, it makes me happy to know that you didn't forget me, or something like that. You could have really added some extra heart to that. But of course we know that Jacob has been in his coffin this entire time, and so... It really is kind of a wasted setup in my eyes. However, it does show that Scrooge is very human and that Marley was his only true friend, and he did genuinely love Marley. It just adds so much to the character. 
Then we cut back to Marley in his coffin, who finally says a prayer and repents for his sins and asks to make amends, and suddenly he is transported to purgatory, where his chain is finally put on him. Again, I only consider this a downgrade because this is really how the film should have started. You should have... Really, you could have cut the guy peeing, or, or had the guy peeing, drop down to the coffin, and we see Jacob lying in his coffin, sleeplessly. And, and you wouldn't have to change a thing about these scenes, you just move the scene to the beginning, then cut to seven years later, and have Jacob have been wandering the earth in his chains. It would have been much, much better. Either way, Jacob's put in his chains, and now the fun gets started. Scrooge, in a really humorous scene, says that because Bob's work that he turns into him is perfect, he believes Bob only did it well to spite him. Despite the fact that the work is done early, Scrooge therefore makes Bob stay because he thinks that Bob is being a smartass by turning in his work perfectly. Bob tells Scrooge that he knows he's using the knowledge he has of how bad the employment situation is to use and abuse Bob, which is seemingly true. We're not giving much of an, uh, of an explanation besides that. Jacob Marley is taken to a forest where he meets the ghost of Christmas past, played just perfectly by Andy Serkis, who burns things Jacob must let go of before he can move on. It's a good visual representation of purgatory. I really like it. Here is another problem, however. It occurs to me that most of my issues with the first half really only have to do with Jacob Marley's treatment as a character. It's stated that Marley's redemption is solely dependent on whether or not Scrooge repents. Now, if Marley himself explained to Scrooge that, for instance, his redemption is the last sin he's atoning for before he can move on, then this idea could work. Sort of a last mission to fulfill his purgatory. And in fact, this scene, instead, he could come back to the Ghost of Christmas Past and maybe they could have known each other. And we would have had to have figured out their relationship and how they had met. And the Ghost of Christmas Past has been giving Marley his directions throughout his time in Purgatory. And maybe now he's like, in his very Andy Circus way, now you're gonna go and you're gonna talk to Scrooge and you're going to tell him the warning. That could have worked much better. But in this version, they actually meet when Marley gets his chains, again, seven years after he died, and Andy Serkis tells him, if Scrooge is not redeemed, you're not redeemed. And that is a major problem. Marley is outright told he's going to hell if Scrooge doesn't repent, which just makes the spirits and even God seem kind of mean in this film. Our story of redemption is about a guy who's already repented, being damned for his friend's sin. How is that fair? Scrooge's nephew, Fred, comes by, as he does in almost every version, but in this production, he's just totally squashed under Scrooge's boot. I mean, this poor guy is crushed, and what makes it worse is that, unlike the other versions, spoiler alert, Scrooge never redeems this relationship. It truly is over. Fred is so important to the story because he gives a fixed point in Scrooge's life, a reality, a tie to his sister and his childhood that can still be accessed to redeem and undo past mistakes later on in the film, or in the book. But Fred, after this brief scene, is sadly never seen again, and, and that's a huge missed opportunity, which I'll go into later. I'm just kind of collecting threads right now. I'm going to tie them all together near uh, around the hour and 50 minute mark of this movie. But the scene is really clever in its subtle religious message. Scrooge says he doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus, just like he doesn't believe in Alibaba or the genie of the lamp. And you'll see why that's just a, a magnificent, magnificent line later on in the film. There's a great line where Fred says that his mother told him to forgive Scrooge because he's still suffering from an old wound. Fred says that he will never return to offer him an invitation again, he then sadly wishes him a Merry Christmas and leaves, saying, I doubt I'll ever see you again on this earth. It's very good, and Scrooge very subtly seems to realize the gravity of what he's lost, but he shakes it off. Scrooge receives two coins that were covering Jacob's eyes, and it seems to spook him. He sends Bob home, but stays himself, talking to Jacob, unwilling to leave early. 
he turns his pocket watch forward to 4 p.m., saying that he wants to lie to himself, saying, lie to me and I'll believe you, but I won't give in to this holiday and leave work early. But then outside, the clock strikes four at the same time. Even the lighting change really sells this moment. Next, the Cratchits celebrate together, and we find out that Bob's wife once received money from her cousin in America that saved Tim's life. They go to mail the letter Tim wrote thanking the cousin, but Martha actually ends up throwing it away. Bob sees all this from a distance, having followed her, and listen, I'm just going to say something that I, you're not supposed to say about any Christmas carol. In this version, the Cratchits are so boring. And it's a shame, because in every other version, they are the heart of the story. Their son is the reason Scrooge is redeemed. And even in this version, that's the case. So why are the Cratchit family so ungodly boring in this production? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because they're never happy. They're never laughing and smiling. Even when they're having dinner as a family... Even when Bob is telling them later that he got a new job, they're never happy. It just makes them so one note, where Scrooge has so many different notes and so much range to him in this production. It's a real shame that the Cratchits are just as interesting as a plank of wood. What makes the story uplifting is that there are people in the world to whom Christmas and their family is the only thing keeping them from blowing their own heads off. And there are other people in the world who thrive on less. And the Cratchits are people who thrive on less. You could actually argue that if their son wasn't disabled, they would go on living in poverty and be pretty happy. And that's the truth of the matter. That's what a lot of people rely on, actually, for some of their political messages nowadays, is, well, look, the rich people are blowing their own heads off, and... The poor people all seem to be, usually, much happier than rich people. This is the perfect time to exemplify that. And yet, I mean, there's just no happy people in this entire production. And it does get a little bit heavy on you by the end when you realize nobody smiles in this production. <laughs> Scrooge walks home, and we get, I believe, the only direct quotes from the book. Are there no prisons? Let them die and decrease the surplus population, etc. This version does do a good job of highlighting that line, but really Scrooge's indifference to the poor is not the focus of this version, and, and you'll see later. It's more about his bad business practices, and that actually leads to a resolution that I'm not sure works to the film's advantage, but again, we'll get to that later. When Scrooge gets home, he notices a carriage and two horses outside in the cold. Seeing the horses seem kind of chilly, he picks up a blanket from the carriage and covers them up. He sees Marley on the door knocker, as you'd expect, and this is really great, especially because the door knocker still looks metal, so you can argue that it is in his head. We, he can pass this off much easier than he could the ghostly glowing versions that you might have seen in Christmas Carol's past. He goes into his home and sits down to eat. The cinematography, by the way, is just gorgeous. The long, eerie shots, the calculated camera movements, the editing, the lighting that mixes gorgeous winter cyans and teals with fireside orange and yellow. It's just gorgeous. And, and these deep, dark, gothic, noir-esque scenery and shadows. It's just perfect for this story. He notices the horses are still outside, and it seems to become kind of nervous, and he locks his doors. The build-up to Jacob's entrance is just exceptional. Scrooge even grabs a poker from the fireplace and starts walking around, ready to take a swing at any ghosts who cross his path. It's a lot like Henry Winkler in An American Christmas Carol, walking around with his shotgun. This is a badass Scrooge. But he finds the mandible of Jacob, which fell off during the door knocker scene, and... Listen, aspiring directors, if you want to make a Christmas Carol film, stop doing weird things with this man's mandible. It's not exciting. It's not dramatic. 
Bob Zemeckis, I love you, sorry, but it's not funny. It distracts from everything, and it's gross. Gross things are not scary. They're not dramatic. They're gross. Gross is just gross. <sighs> okay, with that PSA out of the way, let's continue. Scrooge tries to keep rationalizing and refusing to admit the reality of what he's seeing. It's very good, and Jacob admits that the blanketing of the horses is enough to prove that there is hope inside of Scrooge. Scrooge tries to leave the room, but ends up walking into a factory fire that was caused by his business malpractice. He's indirectly responsible for deaths and injuries in this production, and you really feel the weight of that. He was never aware of the full cost of this fire, and here he's confronted by it. Jacob explains that each link of his chain is a person who was killed or had their life destroyed by their businesses and factories. It's a really, really powerful scene. But there is one thing I can say against it. Jacob is suddenly very remorseful for his sins, and he tells Scrooge that his fate will be to wander the earth saddled with the chain of his ignorance and cruelty. But Jacob only just found out about this himself. In the book, Jacob has had seven years. That's 2,555 days repenting and mourning his chain. This Jacob Marley hasn't. So it's really strange when he's suddenly so broken up about it. We've never seen anything to show him confronting this stuff the way Scrooge is confronting it. But all the same, the acting and the writing for the scene is just immaculate. However, I just think that if, again, we just switched a few scenes around, the order of a few scenes around, just so that Jacob has been wearing this chain for seven years, it's so important that he has genuinely repented himself. And walking around, you know, stressed that Scrooge is not going to repent, wearing a, he a mildly heavy chain that he doesn't seem to have much trouble walking around in, for one night, remember, one night is all he walks around in this chain for in this production. He's not suffering any more than he did in the original. I want him to suffer. I want him to be redeemed as much as Scrooge is, but they both have to suffer to make that happen. Scrooge continues to denying it all, and the humbugs he gives are genuinely good. It's, it's a small thing, but some actors genuinely struggle with that word because it's not in our common everyday parlance. We see Scrooge preparing for battle against the ghost, saying it's going to be a battle of reason against fancy. And that's the end of chapter one. Chapter two, the human heart. In contrast with chapter one, the human beast, we are ready to see what lies deep within Scrooge that has made him so nasty and bitter. Jacob returns to find the spirit, Andy Circus, still burning everything that binds Jacob to the earth in the fires of purgatory. Now, I think this is good because it shows that the spirits do know that Scrooge will be redeemed, because otherwise there's no point in going ahead and burning through the things that keep Jacob tied to this earth if he's not going to get into heaven. I might also add at this point that while I do really like the idea of really accentuating the spiritual aspects of this, because it is a very fundamentally... Um, Christian almsgiving sort of story, you know, helping the poor and all that good stuff that Jesus talked about. It, it's important if you're going to accent these, these little elements, your spiritual world, your spiritual moments of the film have to make sense within some theology, even if it's the theology that you made up yourself. And this one seems really contradictory, but you don't get the full impact until the end. So I'm going to just Stick a pin in that, and I'm going to come back to it, okay? Jacob asks the spirit why he cares when they're just numbers on an inventory list to him. But the spirit passes over the question by saying heaven has observed their evil and that he relishes a challenge. I like how the spirit wears a crown of thorn and looks vaguely like an elderly version of Jesus. It drives home some of the religious undertones of the original story. The spirit reveals that he is the ghost of Christmas past, and he will rip off the scabs on Scrooge's heart so that he is begging for repentance and leaves him to make his own appointment with Ebenezer. We go to the Cratchit's house, and we see that Mrs. Cratchit is laying awake. Bob asks if there's anything she wants to tell him, and he reveals that he knows the money to save Tim was not from a cousin in America, but she won't tell him where it came from until after Christmas is over. 
The Ghost of Christmas Past, whom I may call variants of the words past or the past ghost or something like that, just to make things easier, shows up as a small mouse. Erasmus, the mouse, was Scrooge's childhood pet and the best Christmas present he ever had. Scrooge is struck almost to tears, but then he realizes it's a trick. His cynicism shows, and he explains that he knows the lesson that's trying to be taught here. And <laughs> then he does this. I, I gotta admit, that just cracked me up. Uh, every time I see it, it cracks me up. It's so random and so cruel. <laughs> And of course, we know that it's the spirit, so we don't have to feel sorry for the fact that he's doing this to an animal. Uh, and he knows it's not a real animal, otherwise he wouldn't do it. It's just so out of nowhere that it's just hilarious. He thinks he's beaten the spirit, but immediately Scrooge's father comes in. And his father in this version is not just neglectful. He is outright drunken and abusive and tries to beat adult Ebenezer like he did when he was a child. Now, I want to take a moment to praise how chillingly good Guy Pierce is in this scene, because he is just amazing. And I genuinely mean he is one of the best Scrooges ever. If he was put in a more traditional adaptation, I think he could be one of the definitive Scrooges, right up there with George C. Scott and Alastair Sim in my book. He hears his father coming up the stairs drunk, and he continually keeps telling himself that he is dead. His father is dead. But confronted with his father, he still cowers like a child, the child he is deep down inside. The direction also earns high points for this amazing shot of Scrooge where his shadow is actually a little kid. I just love this whole scene. They knew that they couldn't show a kid being beaten, and nobody would want to put a child in that actual position. So they do it symbolically by showing adult Scrooge being just as helpless and as scared as a child. He even prays to the spirit, asking him not to let his father see him, just as he might have prayed to God to let his father not find him when he was small. It's just so well presented. I just really wanted to take a moment to, to highlight and praise what a good scene this is. Scrooge remembers that this was the night his father was declaring bankruptcy. His father even tells young Ebenezer that the human being is a beast, and just like a good boy, he retained that lesson. It's revealed that his father was angry that Erasmus the mouse was in the house, and just watch this amazing bit of acting from Guy Pierce. I can explain that mouse, father. It was a Christmas gift from Lottie. There are no gifts! And what good is gold to a mouse? The belt wasn't real gold. <laughs> Lottie took it from a toy. It, it, it was gilt and worth only pennies. You could have taken that belt. Just cut the ribbon. You could have... You could have done it without causing any harm to him. He manages to show himself relapse into childhood without breaking character and without being unbelievable. I'm praising him a lot, I know, but I love Guy Pearce. He's such an underrated actor, and... He did not get a lot of praise for this performance, and I think he really deserved it. It's revealed that his father killed the mouse because of a fake gold bell around his neck. Basically, he was saying that it's not fair that he's declaring bankruptcy, but even a vile little rodent can have a gold bell around his neck. It's played in shadows, and it's just... just so such a good scene. His father transforms into Andy Serkis's past character again. Scrooge tells his father that he learned not to have unprofitable relationships from the death of his mouse, and the Ghost of Christmas Past tells him he is here to help him unlearn it. Through a beautiful light effect, we are brought into the past, and Ebenezer, just like in the book, is taken to his childhood school. He recalls his childhood friends, just like in every version, but to add an extra poetic weight to it, he recalls that one of his friends died sometime right after the events of this very Christmas. Then the Ghost of Christmas Past changes from Andy Circus into Alibaba, and this is probably my favorite part of the whole special. In the book, Scrooge read Arabian Nights to escape his loneliness. He even, in his old and cynical body, says that Alibaba was more real to him than his waking life. So in this adaptation, they incorporate this by having the ghost become Alibaba himself. It's a grand idea. It also calls back to his conversation with Fred, when he said that the Lord Jesus was as real as Alibaba, and that camels couldn't travel through the snow. It's just 
ah, it's just deliciously brilliant because it relies so heavily on the religious subtext of the original story, but but it does it in a way that's not in your face. It's showing him that something, whether it's Jesus or Alibaba, can be real and true, even if it's not part of your naturalistic experience of the world. It's showing him, either even for just this one night, look at that, Alibaba is real. Kind of makes you think about what might else be real. This is why I keep trying to make a distinction. It's the story that I have a problem with later on. It's not the writing, because the writing is very good for 90% of the special. They return to find that the headmaster of the school has been sexually abusing Ebenezer. Scrooge has tried to repress these memories and tries to avoid even looking at himself as a child. And, listen, I don't know if Guy Pierce himself was ever abused in any way, but... From my experience in life, and from my own childhood, let me tell you, this man plays this scene perfectly. It, I'm, I'm kind of tearing up thinking, I'm not even watching the special as I'm recording this, but I'm kind of tearing up just thinking about his reaction, how he just slumps up against the wall, and he's just like, this very vague, vacant expression that he gives, it's just, he nails it. He nails it, 100%. Guy Pierce. Bravo. So it turns out that the spirit had appeared to Scrooge on this specific Christmas Eve to give him a respite from his life. And I was really worried when I first saw this, because while I love how dark the idea is, it could easily have gone too far. Happily, the moment is just really just implied, very subtly, and we hear that the headmaster is just telling Ebenezer that he will sleep in the headmaster's bedroom with him again. As Scrooge begs to go home, we see his sister, in this version called Lottie, ride up in a carriage. And heartbreakingly, oh my gosh, I'm going to cry thinking about it, Past says, as Scrooge is begging to be taken home, Past says, not yet, this is the happy year. Implying that this has happened to Scrooge for many, many years. Like in the book, Lottie comes in to save him, but this time, it's to save his life in a different way. The ghost explains he's not doing this to torture Scrooge, but to enlighten him, that he's forgotten all the wonderful things Christmas can do, or perhaps he never even saw them. Lottie says she's taking Ebenezer, and their father has left them. Little Ebby leaves the room, and Past shows him a bit of this Christmas that he didn't know about. The headmister tries to stop them, but once Ebby is out of the room, Lottie pulls a friggin' gun and stops the headmaster. She says she knows that Ebby was only allowed to attend the school in the condition that he stay over Christmas to be abused by the headmaster, a condition his father agreed to. But she and her mother kicked their father out to save Ebby from this victimization. My gosh, this girl is badass. Good job, writers. My gosh, that is so awesome. And in one of the few moments of just absolute levity and joy, Scrooge fangirls over his big sister. Lottie, like a highwayman. She pulled a f***ing gun. It's, she rescued me. A Christmas miracle. An act of love. Without the need for thanks. This is used to show Ebenezer that gifts can be given out of love with no debt and no expectation. His sister never expected repayment for this. She only told Ebenezer that they couldn't afford the fees and never broke his pride by admitting she knew what was done to him. I am friggin' crying. Sorry. <laughs> this is so powerfully done. I can't express how good the first two hours of this are. It's just so good. This is the reality of child abuse. It's so easy to let it jade you for the rest of your life, to let it blind you to real affection. And you have to be strong enough to overcome that or have people that are going to help you through it. But Scrooge, and I think this is really good, stays cynical and says that the pain caused to him actually excuses all his wrongful deeds in the present and that because it's all the past, he can never change it. So past decides to take him deeper. He takes him to a coal mine, which collapsed. A horse in the mine makes Scrooge stop with sympathy. Past explains that because Scrooge and Marley cut back on the costs by stopping miners from using excessive wood to support the mines, the ceiling had no support and killed 27 people and multiple horses on Christmas Eve years ago. 
This is a tremendous, tremendous special effect as we see the mine collapse. And just look at this shot. Whoever shot this shot deserves a mini Oscar. He's taken to his 30th Christmas Eve, where their business is about to take off. When Scrooge and Marley buy a business by buying off an owner's father's gambling debts, try saying that five times fast, and cornering the owner with his own personal tragedy. Past tricks Scrooge into admitting that he has memorized his profits from every year of business. Because he was so hard off as a kid, he has dedicated his life to holding on to every dime he makes, even long after it's gone. It's a beautiful idea. He sees no humans, just accounts, just profit. Scrooge claims that he's done well in his life, but when Past shows him his life, summed up in a simple slideshow, it shows Elizabeth, his bride-to-be, who still waited for him after so many years. He sees her with the children they would have had together. He also sees himself as the father he would never be, with the children he would never have, in a Christmas past that never was. It's just a great idea, but unfortunately, we never actually meet Elizabeth and not even what happens to her or why he leaves her. Now, had we had a scene more like the traditional scenes that we would usually see in A Christmas Carol, and then, after she leaves, we get this slideshow, that would have been very effective. Or maybe even have the slideshow after Andy Serkis says the great lines about the Christmas that never was and the children he would never have bring tears he would never shed. He could, you know, just switch the slideshow again, and then we go into the flashback of the day she leaves. That could be a great build-up. However, we never see any of that. If we had gotten just one scene with her, this would have been much more powerful, but as it is, it's still very effective. Now we come to the scene. The scene. This is the scene that everybody who watched the special knows about. It either made this for you, or broke it for you. No one I know who saw this scene didn't have a big reaction to it. Tiny Tim is born crippled and deformed. Unable to afford the medical bills for an operation to save him, Mrs. Cratchit comes alone to see Scrooge, asking for a loan, which can be paid by taking a shilling or two out of Bob's paycheck. He says he knows she can't pay him back, but says he'll give her the money if she sleeps with him on Christmas Eve. Present-day Scrooge is obviously very ashamed of what he's done, and he plays it very well, but also very subtly. And here's the thing, and I want to acknowledge this before we go any further. This is so nasty and so irredeemable that it's no wonder that for a lot of people, this ruins the entire special. It is very alienating. Scrooge states that he likes to do social experiments to prove how much everything is worth, that everything in life has a price. So this is a test, which is something he says outright, to see if faithfulness and virtue has a price like everything else. And it is established later that he never intended to actually go through with it. But is that enough to save this moment? Chapter 3. A Bag of Gravel Mrs. Cratchit comes to Scrooge's apartment on Christmas Day, a day he chose to illustrate that even the holiest day of the year is just a day, and it's just disposable. Scrooge asks why he feels the cold outside if he's only there in spirit, but Past tells him that he only feels the cold that comes from within his own soul. It leads to a great line. Then if I am to become a compassionate and tender person, I will need thicker socks. <laughs> I just love that line. Once at Scrooge's house, he makes Mary Cratchit verbally state out loud that she has come there to have intercourse with him in exchange for money. He makes her say it. He makes her state it. He clarifies it himself and makes her agree to it. And she clarifies again that this is only for Tim's operation, only to save his life. He looks down, seems ashamed, dismisses it, only says, I know. Very shortly, like he knows the reason for the harshness of the situation, but he has to convince himself that, that this is the nastiness of humanity, that all Christian virtue is an act, a play that's thrown away at the first sign that you can make a buck off of it. He has to convince himself of this, and so he immediately goes back, right back on task. It, it, it's a brilliant bit of acting from Guy Pierce. It shows a lot of emotion. 
It makes him more of a Joker-esque villain who believes all morality is just a form of currency. But here's the issue. Scrooge is not supposed to be a villain. He's supposed to be a hero underneath layers and layers of scar tissue that have to be removed surgically by the ghosts to get to what is still good in him. But we'll have more on that in just a sec. He says her reason for doing it doesn't matter. It's all about knowing how much it costs for a good person to do something bad. An exchange rate for humankind. It's pretty sick, and honestly, the sort of juicy, disgusting nastiness that a good villain would do. This is a really good twist from a spiritual point of view, because Scrooge isn't just a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. He's leading other people purposely into sin with him. He allows her, without any prompting from herself, to strip. He never asks her to do it, but she does. And that can be seen as a little bit of a redeemability for him. He doesn't ask her to do that. She willingly does it. He says verbally, more to himself than to her, that this was all just to confirm his own feelings about human nature. Confirming the nastiness of that the world delivered upon him is just the nature of humankind. So in a psychological way, what, what does work really well about this, what is so good about the scene, if anything can be good about it, is that Scrooge is actually torturing himself, and he's just using Mary Cratchit as an instrument to do it. He doesn't even see her as human. It's purely a way of torturing himself, with further confirmation that his own love, whom he lost, His sister, the schoolmaster who raped him, the idea of family and society itself is all just one big joke. Love is a commodity. He tells her he has no interest in her. She gets dressed, and he even tells her Merry Christmas as she takes the money. This is the scene that makes or breaks the film for most people. It makes Scrooge irredeemable for most people who view it, or at least a good half of people who view it. Especially on the first watching... Because there is a feeling that he is going to go through with this. So for me, it didn't ruin it simply because it's made very clear that he isn't changing his mind. He never intended to rape her through extortion. It was just a social experiment. And the real proof was her intention, not her action. So to me, I can see this as Scrooge just testing her. And on my second and third watch, I really don't mind it as much as I did. But the first viewing really turned me off, and I couldn't enjoy much after this point, because he is so wicked in this moment that I couldn't see past it. But in truth, this actually would have worked for most people if they'd simply done one thing differently. This is not what happened. This is just what I think should have happened. Scrooge should have actually asked Mary to sit down, given her tea, maybe made her some food asked her to do some very banal housework or something. We'd see her dread ebb away and gradually be replaced with extreme confusion. Then after hours of her Christmas day are wasted, he gives her the money. He gives his big monologue about how, because she verbally acknowledged at the beginning that she came there to have intercourse with him, she had already given up her virtue just by showing up with the intent. She never strips, she's not crying, it's just the fact that... She showed up with the intent to have sex for money, and that's all the confirmation that he needed, and that all people are really as ugly as himself deep down. That would have worked, because nothing is actually lost. In this version, because she's crying and she's stripping, we can see this moment as a real trauma. Her crying and trembling is such a harsh, nasty thing to put us through that it's hard to even want Scrooge to be redeemed after this. And and of course, the worst part is just that. Scrooge is not supposed to be the Joker. He's supposed to be redeemable. The Joker makes us all laugh and smile with delight in the dark night because he is so irredeemable and he relishes in it. He doesn't want redemption. Scrooge is meant to be saved and to save other people. This is just too cruel for most people to see it in its proper context, which again, the proper context is that he was raped and beaten throughout his childhood and never saw the heroism of the people who saved him after that years of torture. So the entire world is harsh and bleak and nasty. And this was a tortured soul torturing someone else merely to torture himself. If 
I think I have a different view on it because anybody who was abused as a child understands what this is. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who was abused as a child would do this. It just means that you understand where this feeling is coming from because I would say most of us have had that feeling that you just, you want to torture yourself. You want to put yourself through it again, almost because you blame yourself in a way. And you have to really stop and realize the person that I am putting through hell really did not merit all of the, the hurt I am causing them. But it's because, you know, you still feel that pain deep down. And so in a way, I think that this could have worked very well. And I think they, their excuse was going to be that Mary strips herself. Scrooge is not asking her to do it. He doesn't tell her to do it. He's not taking her clothes off. She does it herself. And I think that that, that was just the hair that pushed the scene too far. She should not have gotten naked. There should have been no suspense that he was going to actually do it. Mary Cratchit stops before leaving and tells Scrooge that she will pray for him that one day, quote, some power of justice will grab him and drag him to a clear, bright mirror where he can see the truth in himself, unquote. This is actually very good because it makes clear that this was the moment that brought the spirits to Scrooge. Then they strangely close on her saying this. I am a woman. And I have the power to summon such spirits. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Okay, I'm all for empowering women, but, uh, what? <laughs> also, uh, listen, is this saying that because Mary is black in this version, that black people have some voodoo power or something? Because that's, um, uh, I'm, I, odd. It's just odd. It's an odd creative choice. Scrooge asks if it was truly her who summoned the spirits and past just kind of passes over the question. And I kind of like that uh, because it does leave open the idea that, oh, maybe she did, maybe she didn't. It's sort of a little wink and a nudge, you know, like, of course she didn't actually have the power to do this. Of course she didn't. But it is kind of a fun little thing that he could, you know, use as a little poking rod, you know, like a little needle that he could just poke into Scrooge to say, I don't know, you just never know. And that could have been clever. But instead, he just passes over it, and they do something really weird at the end of the film. But again, just picking up threads right now, we'll tie it together at the end. Let me be clear, also, I love Andy Serkis. I think he's one of the last great character actors. You know, like those character actors from the 90s that were just brilliant, like Tim Curry. I think Andy Serkis is just amazing. But the fact that Christmas Past is so full of himself and keeps demanding Scrooge to grovel at his feet... That whole bit was old before it started. He doesn't seem powerful. He doesn't even seem holy. So it just comes off as very arrogant. Scrooge yet again reasons his way around his actions in a way that makes it seem like what he did was actually a good thing. And I do like that about Scrooge. He doesn't just accept that he's wrong. He wants to alter the past. So he does it through circular reasoning. Scrooge asks the spirit of Christmas past to tell him directly what is expected of him and he'll change it. But the spirit just leaves after screaming at him that it's not about forgiveness. Well, then if it's not about forgiveness, I don't know what the hell the story is about. Scrooge keeps asking how to change it, how he's supposed to feel, how he's supposed to feel what he's supposed to feel if he doesn't know what it is. And happily, past does leave because this is where I lose my patience with this character. What Scrooge is asking is legit. If it isn't about forgiveness and it isn't about redemption, then what is it about? Because honestly, it really isn't made that clear. Past just comes off as very confused and unsure of what he wants, besides praise and groveling at his own glory. Scrooge, very amusingly, practices saying Merry Christmas in the mirror with a face that clearly says he has a toothache. <laughs> Many benefits. Prosper. I mean, you... Prosper, not me. Seasons, tidings, etc. Et Next, the ghost of Christmas present shows up, and it's his little sister, Lottie. It's an interesting idea, even if it's not an original one. And I actually love the idea of Christmas present being his sister. 
But, and I'm going to jump ahead here and give a little bit of a spoiler, what I don't like and what I think was a huge missed opportunity with this idea was that they never go to visit Fred in this version of Christmas Present. Which is a real shame because it would have been great to see a reunion between Fred's dead mother and Fred who does not even see her. We could get a lot of heart and emotion out of that and yet it's really not taken advantage of at all in this production. She's going to show him in the name of science. Uh, well, just to listen. Any scientific study of human society will illustrate the success of that society is dependent upon the function of the collective. And the function of the collective is dependent on various discrete factors. No, Lottie, I once remarked that you were the brightest person I knew. Hmm. Later I remarked that you were also a bit of a show-off about it. I do like their chemistry, and I like that after the last memory that past shows him, she treats each person in the present as a case study for Scrooge, to learn from it scientifically. It uses his own words against him, but in a different way than was done in the book. They visit the Cratchits, and to drive home the whole idea that gifts are given with no expectation, we see Mary illustrating and writing a book for Tim because they can't afford books which Lottie says he will treasure even more than any book they could buy. And lacking the money for new skates, Bob sits fixing Belinda's ice skates so that she can go ice skating on Christmas Day. Scrooge asks if this is to wring emotion out of him, and Lottie says no. Actually, this is to comfort him. What they lack in money, they make up for in love. As he sees deformed Tim, Lottie explains that love is all that saves the system from revolution, because poor men like Bob thrive without any money. And thus, scientifically and economically, there's a reason for Scrooge to embrace it. And I love that idea. If we saw the original Cratchit family with that monologue, it would be great because they're so happy and they're so content with what little they have. Scrooge does ask, if she's mocking him, and she replies, You mock yourself, putting a value to things that have no price. She asks how many bills and presents there are, but when he can't answer, she points out that his OCD tendency wasn't even stirred. For once in his life, he looked, but he didn't count. He was actually feeling and living in the moment rather than weighing everything by gain. Bob confronts Mary about the money, but she lies and said she stole some diamond earrings from an old lady who had lost her mind several years ago. Scrooge asks why she's lying, and Lottie says it's to spare Bob from the truth. Bob says the truth is the best Christmas present he's ever gotten. And I love Mary's bit of acting here. It's very, very good as she tries to push him away like she doesn't deserve the embrace that he's giving her. Bob then announces to the family that he's found another position and he's going to resign from Scrooge and Marley's. Mary knows that Scrooge might tell Bob if he tries to leave, and so she ruins Bob's happiness and utterly spoils the entire day. It's truly intense and heartbreaking, and Scrooge the entire time is asking Lottie, please let me speak to her. I want to tell her that I will not tell Bob. She, he's free to leave. I don't want to ruin their Christmas. And that is a big step for him. And it shows that the, the outer shell is starting to break. And he is starting to open up. Lottie takes Scrooge to a church in the country where a choir is singing in a memorial service for all those who lost their lives in the Scrooge and Marley mining disaster. There are no tears or self-pity, just people united in the love of those who they lost. Not even any anger. It's truly powerful, and seeing Scrooge standing in this church, lit by the light of truth and love, is one of the best images I've ever seen in A Christmas Carol. Only one boy harbors any hatred, and he's the boy who pisses on Marley's grave every year. Everyone else harbors no hatred at all, just love and forgiveness prompting Scrooge to say this. Given my time again, I would not reduce expenditure on timber. Given the time again, I would not be myself. 
This is the first shining moment of hope for Scrooge, and it's beautifully uplifting. If there were more moments like this in the special in the first half, my gosh, I would have no complaints at all. Every flaw would be overlooked. But it's just that we only get a couple of these moments, and we needed more. We needed to see Scrooge breaking more clearly. It is beautifully uplifting, though, and I don't want to take away from it. He remembers his childhood horse that his father sold, and he admits to Lottie that he knows his father sold him, too. Lottie asks him to talk about his childhood trauma and seek redemption. If saying it conquered it, I would shout it. It doesn't. Lottie, I, sh I should have loved you. You came with your carriage and your gun. Too late. This is so heartbreaking to me. I can't describe the, the scabs that it rips off my own heart. My gosh, it's so powerful. Lottie tells Scrooge not to offer the ghost of Christmas yet to come any excuses, because he is the one who will decide, and he has no interest in the past. There is a profound sense of dread leading into the ghost of Christmas yet to come, and Wow, wow, you can feel it. Whatever is coming is going to be... I mean, with the, the tone the rest of the special has had, whatever we are about to see is going to be some freaking sick, twisted version of the future. It's going to be harsh and nasty. Lottie finally stands up and tells Scrooge goodbye and leaves him alone on the bench, crying and yet again showing Pierce's amazing range as an actor. He looks like a bitter old man and a child at the same time. And as Lottie leaves him, he continues to repeat the words, I couldn't love you. He goes back into the church to meet the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The church is now ruined and dilapidated. Slowly, out of focus, from a shadow in the corner, the ghost of Christmas yet to come forms as a shadow and picks up the broken bell and rings it so the clock will toll to announce his coming. But then... As he comes into focus, we see the ghost of Christmas yet to come, or future as he's called in this one, is just a guy in a gothic funeral outfit with his mouth sewn shut. <clears throat> okay, I've said before that I prefer the classic cloaked garb of the Christmas yet to come ghost because it's, it's full of mystique and symbolism. It's in the book, it's described as black, not, not a, a man in a black cloak, but as black and shapeless, almost like a fog, in a way. It's a cloak, but it's almost fog-like. I always imagined it looking something like the Dementors from Harry Potter, but more out of focus, more blurred, more shapeless. And I think it also, in our modern times, we could have finally had the technology to make a truly badass Ghost of Christmas yet to come through CGI and practical effects mixed together. But I wouldn't mind this take on the character where he's a funeral director with his mouth shown shut. I think it's a fine, a fine adaptation. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It would have been fine if it wasn't for one thing. The movie poster and the thumbnail show the classic design. And not only that, it's one of the coolest designs I've ever seen. <laughs> Look at that. Imagine seeing that thing ringing the bell and approaching Scrooge with, like, Maybe uh, take a leaf out of the George C. Scott production and have, like, the screaking of a funeral gate. You know, m music that's almost like screaming violins. Uh, it would be so, so amazingly, amazingly powerful. Why was this design used on the thumbnail if it's never... And I, l listen to me, I've watched the whole thing, I repeat that, never used in the film. Why is it there? It was only every advertisement. <sighs> Anywho, the Ghost of Christmas Future takes Scrooge to his own office, where Cratchit hands in his resignation to Scrooge's empty desk. And Belinda comes in to get her father before Scrooge can finish reading it, telling Bob there's been an accident. Through an amazing visual, suddenly we're under the frozen pond, and we see that Tim stole Belinda's ice skate and tried to skate, but fell through the ice. He dies in this version the very next day. And I like how the Ghost of Future can tell Scrooge's thoughts by touching his head. 
and directly giving him knowledge of what he would say if he could speak. I like it, but it raises a very important question. Scrooge verbally acknowledges that the reason that the ghost's mouth is sewn shut is because the, the future is unknowable, and therefore he can't talk to Scrooge. So if that is the case, and the ghost does nod and acknowledge that Scrooge is right when he says that, how is the future ghost still giving him information, and why would that be allowed, and then his mouth still be shown shut? It's kind of confusing. Scrooge asks to have a chance to change these events so that Tim will live. Then we get a wonderfully powerful moment where Scrooge, as a spirit, can see Tim's own spirit leaving his body. It's really powerful, and it's a surreal moment, and it's kind of surprising to me. I never thought about this idea. But now that I have thought about it, now that I have had that idea put in my head, it's odd that more versions don't do it, because it's, it's kind of amazing. Scrooge falls through the ice and into his apartment, where he sees himself in the bed. In this version, he just lifts the blanket and sees himself dead. Carolers sing outside, showing that he dies on Christmas, but Scrooge in this adaptation of the future says he doesn't even care what will become of himself. He states that there's only one thing he cares about, but it's kept from us for now. The young man from the beginning now pisses on Scrooge's gravestone. As Scrooge watches, Scrooge simply says, Bravo. Scrooge sees the Cratchits visiting Tim's grave, having a picnic in the snow, still eating Christmas dinner with their son, ever faithful and true to their family. Scrooge sits on his own tombstone, realizing all that he could have had if he could have only left his trauma and pain behind. Jacob comes back to visit with Scrooge one final time to attempt to redeem Scrooge. Scrooge outright refuses redemption, because he says he doesn't deserve forgiveness. Realizing how bad and nasty he has been, and how irreparably harmed everyone around him is, he says that this piss-covered, second-class grave is all he deserves. This is sort of what excuses Scrooge's irredeemable nature in this version, at least to me. This version is very, very different, because Scrooge is not meant to be redeemed by asking for it, but purely through his actions and how he changes. All the efforts were for nothing, because I refuse redemption. And if redemption were to result in some kind of forgiveness, I do not want it. Because I would find a way to justify everything I have done according to the consequence. The only thing I want the spirits to do, the only change I want them to make, is to spare the life of him. One of the most chilling, chillingly powerful moments is at 2 hours, 43 minutes, and 27 seconds into the series, when after Scrooge's redemption, Marley lays down in his coffin, free of his chains, finally to get his everlasting rest, having been redeemed. It's powerful, and the first time I saw it, it did actually kind of choke me up a little bit. I think it would have been more powerful had Jacob been suffering that full seven years rather than just laying in the coffin for seven years, but it still is nonetheless very powerful, and we get one final callback to this at the end that is even more powerful. Scrooge actually does not wake up in this production, but all the shadows of the future disappear around him. He runs through town from the cemetery and falls on ice in the road. He sees an old woman sprinkling a bag of gravel on the ice to keep people from slipping. This is really great. In a single moment, he sees how he was completely wrong. There are gifts given with no expectation of repayment. Some gifts given to society as a whole, and you never even see the result of it. Taking the bag of gravel, he rushes to the Cratchit home. Along the way, he gives very genuine and heart-filled Merry Christmases. He gets to the pond Tim would die on and throws gravel all over it, making skating impossible. The music and Pierce's urgency are just uplifting. My spirit just feels like it swells whenever I see this scene. It's truly grand. This I will do. This I will gladly do. I don't know if he's quoting something or why he uses that specific phrasing, but there's something about the phrase, this I will gladly do, that coming from this character 
just it, it's just it is amazingly uplifting. And of course, it's the first time he is giving a gift with no expectation, knowing that nobody will even know he did it. A gift with no expectations, no strings. Scrooge comes to the Cratchit home and is given the very sour greeting you'd expect. He tells the Cratchits that he knows Bob is going to resign and Scrooge gives him his full blessing to go, much to Mary's relief. Scrooge then says he is closing his company down tomorrow and Scrooge and Marley will trade no more in this world. That's a great line. Finally, he says he is drawing up a check of 500 pounds to Bob Cratchit in thanks for his service. This is a great scene, really. Overall, it's just a great scene. No, this is what happens when someone finally understands. He's made to understand what it is to be human. Cratchit shakes his hand and he wishes them all a Merry Christmas. Mary shows him out and tells him, Your 500 pounds will be welcome, but you will not buy forgiveness. Nor shall forgiveness ever be earned, nor expected or wanted. My business now is the future, for the spirit and the bright light and the mirror. I thank you. This is good. It's a very powerful scene, especially since Mary has no idea what he's talking about, right? It was just an empty thread, of course, because no one could ever consciously summon spirits, especially not just because you're a woman, <laughs> of course. What a great ending. Scrooge leaves to go and do some good in the world, slowly starting to smile as the wonderful Christmas cheer surrounding him finally invades his spirit. Finally, he's awake to his fellow man, and he even gives a wonderful little line where he tells Marley to rest well. Sleep well, Jacob. Wow, that's good. He knows that Marley's been redeemed, and he can finally let go. Stop talking to Marley because he knows he's not there anymore. He has moved on. He has achieved his redemption and his salvation. And because of what Scrooge says to Mary Cratchit, we know that Scrooge, despite the fact he doesn't want to be redeemed, he feels his own redemption at hand, and he is going to continue working to make that redemption possible. He's going to keep living a life that is for the betterment of mankind, and he is going to give, through his actions, he is going to live the faith that humankind is not just a beast, but a real beautiful spirit underneath the fleshy exterior. What a grand ending. I'm very glad they didn't ruin it or undercut everything they've been working on with a tacky pinned online that completely screws with a million scenes that happened before it. Spirits, past, present, and future. There is still much to do. Oh my gosh. I, you know what? I didn't realize that you could ruin an entire movie with one line. But they did it! Amazingly, and seriously, it does ruin everything that came before it. I mean, this was already a version that is going to alienate a lot of viewers, but this spits in the face of everyone else who enjoyed it. Logically, there is no way she could have known about the spirits, or she would have acted completely different in every scene prior to this. And listen, again, I, you know, I'm all for empowering women, but being a woman does not give you supernatural powers. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> and then she breaks the fourth wall just for a cheap, ooh, gotcha moment. If it had been left here, with Scrooge leaving making it something you could take as a little threat she made without fully realizing the ramifications of it, it would have worked so much better. Literally, both of the major problems with this version revolve around the treatment of Mary Cratchit. Even the stuff with Marley could be excused as just inconsistencies. The money-lending prostitution scene and this ending are both the biggest issues. One of which I can take. I can take the money lending thing, but this ending I simply cannot. Just cutting to credits 30 seconds 
maybe a minute earlier, might have made this a very serious and dark version of the story. Maybe a contender for one of the best versions. Even not having Scrooge redeemed in a traditional way, because they make it clear by the ending that he actually has accepted his forgiveness and his redemption, and that he does plan to live the rest of his life, that it's not just about Tim Cratchit. It's about seeing the value in all humanity, and that he is now going to go and live a completely different life. All of that does work, but this is childish. This really does ruin the entire film, just for me personally, which is why I still watch it. I still like the version. I just turn it off a little bit earlier, just 30 seconds earlier. If you want a dark adaptation of Scrooge, with very little levity and very little bright moments, this is very good. It does suffer from Scrooge's redemption, not being nearly as happy or joyful as I personally think it should have been. But to be fair to this version, that might not have even worked if it was much happier. It's very cynical and unforgiving. But for the most part, I like it as its own unique piece with a bit of an acquired taste. I think that personally, the darker you go with it, the more happy a traditional ending becomes. Because the darker and more cynical the version is, for instance, even the uh, Jim Carrey, Rob Zemeckis version, which is an animated Disney movie, is very, very dark. I mean, the Ghost of Christmas Present, crumbling into dust, uh, I mean, all of this stuff, it's very, very dark. And so, when Scrooge is alive at the end, you feel really good about it. This version does have a very acquired taste, though, and I can appreciate how a lot of people just are not going to like it. It is dark, but it does have a point to the darkness. I think it goes too far in some places, but it is not something that is just dark for the sake of being dark, like the uh, David Fincher movie Seven, which is just dark for the sake of being dark and really has no purpose to it. This does have a beautiful, beautiful sense of cynicism to it. And I think it's it's a good version. I think you have to watch it maybe two or three times before you really, really uh, get everything in it. Because you have to know what's coming really to appreciate the ending. It's not something that you can watch once and it's not going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. It probably will leave a bad taste in your mouth, just to be honest with you. And of course, again, it botches the entire film in the last 30 seconds. But if you skip over that last 30 seconds and just end it with Scrooge walking away, it's a really good version in my opinion. And I think it got a lot of hate just because it is so shocking with how dark it goes in some places. But if you do want to check it out, I would advise it. It's only $3 on Amazon Prime. So give it a watch. It has a lot to offer. Just don't expect the uplifting nature of the original to shine through in the end. It's very subtle. It's very downplayed. You just have to expect that if you're going to enjoy it. So thank you everyone for watching and have a Merry Christmas.